Cool. All right. Then it looks like we can see each other. So um, let's get started with week three, the Brothers Karamazov. We read the Grand Inquisitor passage for today. Um, as I was just saying, it's one of my absolute favorites in uh, 19th century literature. Um, and it's both philosophically powerful, which we'll talk a lot about today, um, and narratively powerful for the book. It, it's sort of this massive moment that comes back. And um, if you do decide to read uh, the Brothers K, this shouldn't be a spoiler. In fact, it's not a spoiler. Um, and I'll avoid all spoilers because it is a book absolutely worth reading. It's one of my um, favorites. It's just a ton of fun. Um, so, um, after a brief introduction to existentialism, I mentioned that we'd be going back to its beginnings before we like dug into the core existentialism of called the one syllabus. Um, and Dostoevsky in many ways is considered like a grandfather of existentialism that uh, he may not himself count as one of the existentialists because um, he doesn't contend with say like the problem of being explicitly, but all of the themes and ideas present in uh, Dostoevsky's works, and specifically in the Brothers Karamazov, and even more specifically in uh, the Grand Inquisitor, uh, are all contending with existential issues. Now, um, I think it, it's going to be important to understand who Dostoevsky was to um, see the uh, nascent features of existentialism in the Grand Inquisitor passage, um, and also to interpret it at all. Um, so what I'm going to do is begin lecture by introducing Dostoevsky as a person, really as a character of the class. Um, and this is a controversial strategy. So as like a fun aside, there's uh, this thing called the intentional fallacy uh, that uh, resides in some English departments um, and less in others, sort of depending on how revisionist and new your English department is. Um, but it did have a prominent role in just about every um, uh, English department and many philosophy departments in the 20th century. Um, and it was so potent that like people lost their jobs over it, right? So if you're like committing what's called the intentional fallacy, um, it was like a kind of McCarthyism of um, fallacious literary interpretation. So what's the intentional fallacy? The intentional fallacy is reading the author into the work. So the idea is that if you consider the life of the author as uh, you interpret uh, a work of art, then you're committing an intentional fallacy because you are um, not treating the work of art as its own like individual distinct object. Um, I kind of think that's BS. I think that the motivations of a person, the, the reasons that make, especially of an author, the, the reasons that make the author, that motivate the author to feel that like necessity to write, to contend with the world um, in a way that produces a book like that, right? Like a thick monster of a novel, right? Um, that's full of interesting philosophical content comes from a place of inspiration and understanding that place of inspiration um, can give us at least a channel inwards into um, the an interpretation of the book. So um, when considering the intentional fallacy, I sort of think to myself, knowing who the author is, is a really helpful tool to reading the book. Um, but it's probably also helpful to come up with our own interpretations as well. Um, so for instance, like with The Stranger last week, right? We talked a little bit about neurodivergence and pathology um, as perhaps explanatory of Merceau's behavior. This is probably not what Camus had in mind. Um, I don't think Camus wanted to justify uh, Merceau's behavior at all. However, um, to, to make that sort of claim and then to justify an alternative interpretation like one that's purely existential that doesn't involve uh, pathology or neurodivergence, um, would be to commit the intentional fallacy. Now, um, if we read the work on its own, we might come to this conclusion that, say, the, the uh, actions of Merceau are best explained pathologically. Um, and then we come up with our own interesting interpretation of a pathological Merceau that fits into this feeling of the absurd uh, story in its own sort of unique way. 
Um, but if we focus too much on the author, that could route us away from other alternative, interesting interpretations of the work. So keep that in mind. Like, don't let yourself be routed one way or the other. I am going to introduce Dostoevsky, though, um, as a person and as a character. Um, so, if, you know, intentional fallacy or not, here we go. Um, so Fyodor Dostoevsky was born in 1821 uh, to a poor family. Um, his father was a petty tyrant beat him, treated him like, uh, you know, tr really poorly treated him. Um, and I think he died young, uh, while, while Dostoevsky was young. Um, and as Nabokov says, uh, under the lens of a Freudian microscope may just be um, uh, uh, represented in Ivan's character, in some strange Freudian way. Um, after the upheavals of 1848, so in 1848, this is a good Wikipedia binge for those of you with hyperfocus ADD, um, like myself. Uh, look up 1848 in Europe. It's this insane year, it, not just in Europe, across the world, where like every country revolts. So we have Russian Revolution, we have uh, South American Revolution, left and right, like overthrowing colonial powers and taking back the banana farms and um, and. and uh, we, we begin to see like this uh, overthrowing of the old monarchical aristocratic structure of society, probably much inspired by the French Revolution and um, now a generation after Napoleon. There's just this like will for new political voice in the, the minds uh, and eyes of the people. So after these upheavals in, in 1848, um, there was a wave of reaction in Russia. Russia cracks down on um, uh, anyone who uh, like advocates for freedom of speech and voice and all this. Um, and there's this guy, Belinsky, a famous Russian author uh, who spent most of his life in France where he was allowed to say what he wanted to say. Uh, but Belinsky wrote this letter, right? And it was a letter uh, condemning the, the Russian czars um, uh, asking for human rights and for freedom of speech and for like the author to be able to say what they want to. Um, very French, very maybe neo-communist, um, at least very anti-establishment. And uh, this letter is banned. It's nobody's allowed to read it, but there are salons and soirees, little groups of people who will get together, share this letter around and uh, live uh, a rebellious sort of life um, as, an intellectual, as an intellectual. And Dostoevsky, as a young man, is one of these people, and he's hanging out with a bunch of his author friends when the police knock on the door and arrest the whole lot of them, right? So this is right at the beginning of Dostoevsky's um, young political intellectual life, uh, arrested and um, brought before uh, a judge, um, and he was sentenced with eight hard years of labor in Siberia. Like this is a guy who's never worked with his hands in his life, but he's an author. Um, and eight hard years in Siberia, but that's not the worst of the story. So when he's um, put before the judge, this, the, the judge says to, to Dostoevsky and all his comrades, you're condemned to death. And they don't tell them that you are actually only gonna live in Siberia for eight years doing hard labor uh, until they've stripped each man down uh, and tied them to a pole uh, and put the, the uh, firing squad before them and says, ha, never mind, JK Lull, uh, you're free to go to Siberia for eight years of hard labor. So just like does this terrible trauma, right? Like creates PTSD, cracks the minds uh, and wills of these uh, authors. And this is the state of mind in which Dostoevsky was sent to Siberia. While he's in Siberia, he is uh, put in an internment camp with the worst criminals in all of Russian society, like murderers and pedophiles and uh, like people who are committing crimes um, in the camp itself. So like he's watching people, humans be as terrible as they possibly can be to one another. Um, and he's trapped with the worst of humanity for all of this time. And all he has is a Bible and he reads it over and over and over and over. 
And it's in this period that Dostoevsky likely develops um, what, uh, I have the quote written down, what Nabokov says um, is this tendency of Dostoevsky's characters to um, sin their way to Jesus, right? So something happens in Siberia to Dostoevsky. He goes, he's a little crazy the rest of his life, um, where this mixture of salvation through biblical reading, which is his only respite from the terrible suffering and um, uh, evil, uh, the malignant, disgusting quality of human life that he sees there, um, his salvation, and then like the fact that he's a part of that malignant, disgusting feature of human life. Um, and so what Dostoevsky does in all of his novels is sort of has this like run through theme of perfection through tragedy, right? Um, the sinning your way to Jesus, that the worse that you become, eventually you break through to the other side, you get west by going all the way east, um, and you wake up into yourself or uh, Raskolnikov wakes up into himself or say Ivan in, in the case of the brothers Karamazov, um, uh, Stavrogin, who doesn't actually, but um, for good reason. Uh, it, but those of these main characters do this thing where they're, they become more and more terrible until it makes them realize how terrible they are. And in realization, they accept salvation, but it's only through that terrible suffering and condemnation uh, of themselves that they're able to get to that point. Um, and we see that in the Grand Inquisitor passage, sort of a, a little bit under the covers. Um, he had a couple of wives. Um, he had a son. I think he, Dostoevsky, had epilepsy, I'm pretty sure. Uh, and I know that his young son died of epilepsy at a, at a young age. Um, and this young son inspires characters like Prince Mishkin of the Idiot and Alyosha, who is a character of what we read today. Um, one important feature of Dostoevsky's characters across all of his novels is that they represent ideas. They're they're human, right? They, we can connect with them and, and understand them, um, but they tend to represent less humanity than a fully robust character in other literature uh, and more uh, of a concept. So while human, they're sort of extremely so in one, one such way or another such way, right? Um, and the characters of the brothers Karamazov um, each represent a different feature, at least in my interpretation, of the human body, the human soul, of what it is that makes us who we are. So we have Dimitri, who we don't see um, in the passage that we read, who represents the heart, passion. Um, and he's crazy passionate and doesn't think with his head, and, um, but, but he's noble, right? Uh, and Alyosha, who represents the soul, this simplicity, this innocence that everyone loves, um, he has a religious fervor. Uh, there's Ivan, who is the mind, the intellect, that sees everything all too clearly, right? sees the dark, rigid lines of human life, of uh, the world that we live in, uh, and they're so rigid as to become sharp and cut him right back. Uh, there's Fyodor, the father of the brothers Karamazov, who is, I, I think, represents the body. It's all sensual pleasure. He's a terrible awful person who um, just has like parties with, um, uh, takes advantage of, of everybody in the village to have parties and lends money and is not a nice person. Uh, and then there's Smerdyakov who is the demon inside all of us. Um, and in terms of landscape, in terms of setting, as Novikov says, what landscape there is in a novel by Dostoevsky, um, it's a landscape of ideas. It's a moral landscape. The weather does not exist in his world, so it does not matter much how people dress. Dostoevsky characterizes his people through situation, through ethical matters, their psychological reactions, their inside ripples. And so through his works, Dostoevsky is really dealing with philosophical problems in a philosophical way, but using literature as sort of his modus operandi of uh, questioning, of dealing with philosophical questions. Um, and again, Nabokov says, for this reason, Dostoevsky missed his calling to be Russia's greatest playwright. Um, Nabokov 
made a lot of fun of Dostoevsky. Um, so, uh, talked about the characters. Um, so let's get straight into the Grand Inquisitor passage. Um, there's a handout, by the way, um, for everybody who's online. Um, the handout is on Canvas, Arguments for Rebellion, I think. And then I put the sheets over there on that table. If somebody wouldn't mind beginning passing them around. Um, we'll look at those in just a moment. They're outlines I did of Ivan's argument in the uh, Rebellion chapter. So the Grand Inquisitor passage, what we read for today, is a conversation between the soul and the mind, between Alyosha and Ivan, right? And it's their two perspectives batting back and forth with uh, the eternal questions. We in the green of youth have to settle the eternal questions first of all, right? Um, so I'm kind of curious, I, this sort of doesn't have to do with existentialism or Grand Inquisitor passage, but, but I, I am wondering when you guys read this, and then you go on to read the Grand Inquisitor passage. If you were to sit down in a cafe or a bar, or whatever, um, with a friend with the intent to like have a philosophical conversation, um, and and you wanted to talk about the eternal questions, would you have a conversation anything like the one Ivan and Alyosha had? No. What, what would you talk about? Like, what are the eternal questions? So you who are in the green of youth, what, what are your eternal questions? I think you have to have a relationship such as brothers. I don't know that you would carry on such a conversation with just a casual friend. Yeah, that you might not be so intimate because it seems intimate. The, the ideas are dangerous and um, and you, yeah, that, that might just not come out with, with someone other than a sibling. I wouldn't know, I'm an only child, so I don't have like that perspective, but I, I appreciate it. That, that's it's not, maybe not something that would be shared regularly. What else, but what are the eternal questions? Yeah, for I you? guess suffering might come up for me, but I mean, the way they talk about it here is I don't know, they're much more eloquent than I. So the conversation I think has a much different character. You know? Well, you had like a decade to write it in a conversation you probably have like yeah. 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so suffering, that's an internal question. What else? Just I'm just curious. Like what are the big questions that like trouble us, that worry us? Purpose. Purpose. Problem of evil. Justice. Justice. Morality. Okay. Freedom. Freedom. All right. So that's all pretty much the Grand Inquisitor. <laughs> all right. The eternal questions remain the same uh, 200 years later, 150 years later. Um, so Ivan has this creed in the rebellion chapter, which precedes the Grand Inquisitor. Even if I lost faith in everything that there is in the world, beyond all logic, I would want to go on living to go on loving the world. And I think this is important to keep in mind as we go forward, as the, the Grand Inquisitor says what the Grand Inquisitor says, um, that this remains true throughout. So Ivan, at least to me, doesn't strike as a nihilist, someone who is um, living in the world only for the sake of the fact that they're like biologically alive and that there is no such thing as meaning, there's no such thing as redemption, there is no purpose, right? There is only power. Um, I don't think that characterizes Ivan. So, okay, before I keep going, I should say, I am personally an eternal optimist. So the interpretation that I give of the Grand Inquisitor comes from that perspective. Um, I've found in giving this lecture in the past, I've given this lecture a bunch of times, it's one of my favorites. Uh, many students don't agree with me that said like, Spencer, you're crazy, right? That you can't get redemption out of this. It's too far gone, right? Um, so uh, that's good, disagree with me. Um, but keep in mind that uh, my interpretation is an optimistic one. 
and though consistent may not be the best one or yours, but is hopefully again like a um, a channel to getting an understanding, at least like getting some grip and texture on how to get it all. So it's okay to disagree with me, and you probably will if uh, past uh, experience says anything about how this usually goes. So Ivan, I suggest, I submit, is not a nihilist. He wants to go on living. He wants to accept the world, though he does not. Um, and this is this is a, a first sort of touch of absurdity of, of a kind of existentialism. Um, Ivan is rebellious, right? He wants to go on living, but what he's about to talk about in the rest of the chapter is terrible, awful suffering. And he's about to disavow um, the, the work of God or even in a hypothetical, um, the most perfect sort of beatific vision, the harmony of, of all humans at the end of history where um, we all find ourselves unified in God and happiness, and, and Ivan says, "No, I'm going to return my ticket." Right? That um, that here is a sort of first condition of absurdity. That in spite of what he's about to say, in spite of what he's about to share, he does want to go on living, um, and he's taking the time to like have this heartfelt, intimate conversation with his brother, with Alyosha, to um, maybe find. Uh, admiration or justification in himself and his own ideas, maybe to um, see what Alyosha communicates back in return so that he can maybe find that reason to keep on going that he has a desire for, but what's the purpose, right? Um, in the space between purpose and desire, there is the absurd. Uh, and maybe Alyosha has that answer for, for Ivan and maybe not. Um, but this is the conversation of the eternal questions that gives rise to the Grand Inquisitor passage. The conversation itself uh, takes place um, in a cafe and then takes the form of an argument with premises and with conclusions, uh, which then crescendos into the Grand Inquisitor poem. Um, and there are three arguments in Ivan's discussion with Alyosha um, that will cover at least two of. So now we have your handouts. Hopefully this helps keep things a little clear. Um, so first, the, the first pass is not an argument. It's just sort of dogmatic. Um, Ivan says, look, I accept God. And the night before, we don't read this because I don't have you read the whole book. Uh, at dinner, Ivan says, God is dead. There is no God, right? Um, and shocks everyone at the dinner table. Um, and Ivan may or may not think this, whether or not he's like truly an atheist. Um, I don't think even matters to Ivan, right? So if you said like, Ivan, does God exist? And say, I, it, I'll accept it if God does. I, I would accept God's existence. Um, but notice the like conditional quality of that statement. I would accept God's existence. So like God's existence kind of doesn't matter to Ivan um, because the world itself is going to turn out to be unacceptable, unredeemable. Um, so I then I accept God, all of his wisdom and purpose, and uh, I accept the eternal harmony that God represents, uh, but I do not accept the world that God has created. So as, as Ivan says, I believe like a child that suffering will be healed and made up for, that all the humiliating absurdity of human contradictions will vanish like a pitiful mirage, like the despicable fabrication of the impotent and infinitely small Euclidean mind of man, that in the world's finale, at the moment of eternal harmony, something so precious will come to pass that it will suffice for all hearts, for the comforting of all resentments, for the atonement of all the crimes of humanity, of all the blood they've shed that it will make it not only possible to forgive, but to justify all that has happened with men. But though all that may come to pass, I don't accept it. I won't accept it. Even if parallel lines do meet and I see it myself, I shall see it and say that they've met, but I won't accept it. And this is a pretty powerful passage. This is Ivan saying, look, the world operates in Euclidean space. It doesn't, but Dostoevsky didn't know any better. So the world mm -hmm. operates mathematically, right? That there are uh, natural laws that explain everything, that there's cause and there's effect, as mm -hmm. Ivan says, that um, determinism holds true, that we can measure out and map 
the course of the world if we only knew all of the details of it. And we can know all the details of it because they're right there empirically before us. Um, so Ivan says, look, uh, parallel lines never cross, but there are some people in the world who say that they will, who say that the world is not just deterministic, but it has a true end, a point along the, the line um, in parallel with its, with its pair at which those lines cross. And that means like God exists, that there is a spiritual world, that um, there is a quality or state of being that is separate from the worldly state of being that is God's state of being. Maybe these parallel lines do cross. Maybe the Euclidean space of our natural world determined by natural laws can be violated. And even if it were, even if in that violation, there was the beatific vision, there was heaven on earth, there was a rapture in which everyone is saved, in which all of the suffering is made up for, everyone is expiated and atoned, uh, their sins are washed away, um, that maybe this world that only has parallel lines can see them cross in that sort of way, which you know, might just be the place the atheist gets off the boat. Ivan um, doesn't get off the boat there. He says, look, I will accept that this story is, is real, um, but this especially makes me not accept the world. Why is that? Well, Ivan's just painted the ideal harmony of a world in which God exists in the most charitable light. Right? He's just granted to the theist everything that the theist hopes for in, in salvation, um, and eventually, as we'll see in the Grand Inquisitor in Christ, um, and still won't accept the world. God can make up for everything, yet Ivan refuses to accept it. Um, so he makes two arguments um, for Alyosha's sake before um, contending with the idea of Christ. Uh, so um, in this is where the, the chapter gets hard, right? Where Ivan starts talking about really terrible things that humans do to each other, like nailing their ears to fences and shooting babies in the face after they make them laugh, right? Like terrible things. Um, and there are three stories in particular that um, uh, stand out to Ivan that are supposed to like be the moral force of um, the problem of evil and of suffering in the world, the, the reason that we ought not to accept the world, even if we accept God, um, which is one, uh, parents who uh, adopt a girl and beat her in the, with, with a, a, a like bush or stick that's spiny, so it makes her bleed and it hurts more, and they're like, ha, great. Um, another one where they have uh, the, like the girl's actual parents uh, stick her in an outhouse all night long in the, the frozen winter and she is in you know filth uh, all night praying to God like save me this isn't safe and a young boy who throws a stone at uh, a lord's favorite dog and the lord the next day has the the rest of the hounds tear apart the boy in front of the, the boy's mother well, why does Ivan focus on children? Does anybody remember? Yeah. He talks kind of like about like how they represent innocence and kind of brings it back to Adam and Eve and how they have these things. So it's like him first. Yeah. Um, so what, what is it? Yeah, go ahead. Also says that it's a more simpler conversation that just makes it a lot like it, you know, like shortened it by time. Yeah. So, right. The, the focus on children is to say, look, what explains this terrible suffering, this terrible evil that's done, um, the, the awful condition, the state of the world? Well, adults have all sorts of reasons to cause harm to one another. And we know better and we do it anyways. Children don't, children don't know any better. And if they did, I mean, they don't, thank goodness. But if they did, they wouldn't nail people to fences, right? Um, there's, children haven't lived yet and yet they're human. And it's in this difference that we find innocence. 
a feature of, of being in the world unsullied, unstained by the necessity of um, adult life. So have you seen like The Good Place? Has everybody seen, am I, can I spoil it? Is, is it? Would anybody be mad at me if I spoiled The Good Place? Okay, well, okay. So the, the premise of The Good Place is that um, everybody's in hell, but they make it seem like heaven and they like torture you with little irritations because the little irritations are supposed to be way worse or something. Fun Ted Danson joke. Um, so the idea of the good place is that even if you try to do well, you're still gonna go to hell. Like nobody goes into heaven anymore um, because we're all complicit in the harms and suffering and evils of the world that we all, the animal product, products or uh, drive fossil fuel bearing uh, vehicles that cause climate change, and uh, we um, give our money to terrible insurance companies, and you know, whatever. Um, we buy clothes that are made um, with the tiny little child hands of um, poor sweatshop people across the world. Um, and nobody can be free of the world that we live in. Uh, we're all complicit. We, we choose our battles as best we can, but nobody's innocent, right? Um, but children are. Children don't make those choices. Um, they don't have to make those choices. They're not forced to just yet. They don't have to survive. They just have to grow up, right? And so the innocence of a child is supposed to highlight the like true, terrible quality of evil that exists in the world that the evil we do to each other might be necessary or explained in some way or another, but the evil that's done to children, like there's no justification and yet it exists. Um, and so this is why Ivan focuses on children. They highlight the point. Um, we don't have to worry. We can skip five times of conversation because we don't have to worry about all those extra justifications of harm and evil done between adults, that there's just no reason for children to suffer and yet they do. So, um, Ivan says the innocent must not suffer for another's sins, especially such innocence as children. So what he's saying is, look, um, innocence is, uh, or, or ought to be, it's a moral claim. Innocence ought to be indefatigable. It ought to be untouchable, unflappable. It ought to be something that, um, is not sullied and ruined. Um, and also proclaims that in every man, a demon lays hidden. So if we remember the main characters of Polish Karamazov, Smerdyakov represents the demon laying hidden in all of us. Um, and uh, it's because of this quality of, of being a human, this drive to survive, to overcome, to fight, to satisfy desires and passions that evil is done in the world. There's a little bit of evil in all of us and we can't help it. Um, and children haven't grown up to become their demons yet. So from this, I've inferred that, look, the evil in us is the reason that children suffer. They wouldn't suffer if we didn't all have a little bit of evil in us. The world is constituted such that it becomes permissible to harm innocents, to commit moral atrocities. But why is it permissible, right? We might say, like, you ought not to do it, and yet we can. Any one of us today could like walk down to a school and do terrible things. And it happens way too often. It's permissible. It, it is within the power of our freedom to cause unjustified, completely unjustified, um, unimaginable suffering and moral atrocity. We can all do it. We won't, but we can't. It's like within our free power. Um, and just as a matter of like natural law in the world, gravity pulls us down, right? Um, we have that ability within us. And that is frightening and terrible. And this is why Ivan will not accept the world because the world is a place that makes it permissible just in terms of possibility um, to, um, to commit such heinous acts. But why is it permissible again? Well, it's because we're free or it's because God willed it, right? So there's sort of a disjunction here, like the permissibility, the possibility of the 
uh, destruction of innocence. Um, could be something that humans themselves will, like the parents and the stories that Ivan tells, or it might just be because like God has a plan, right? God set out a plan and this is just the way that it's supposed to work. Um, and what Ivan will show, uh, and we see on our handouts as we go through these arguments, um, is uh, that neither are satisfactory. So Ivan asks this fatal question, do you understand why this infamy must be and is permitted? Without it, I am told, man could not have existed on earth, for he could not have known good and evil. Why should he know the diabolical good and evil when it costs so much? Why the whole world of knowledge is not worth that single child's prayer to dear kind God as she looks up at the bottom of the shitter that she's stuck in, freezing in overnight, and suffering? The whole world of knowledge is not worth that one child's prayer to dear kind God. So we mentioned the problem of evil, should bring it back up. Um, the problem of evil is a age old theological and philosophical problem that says, uh, God is all powerful, all good and all knowing um, and evil exists in the world. How can these two facts be made consistent uh, or are they inconsistent, right? So if God is all powerful, God could make anything happen, right? Uh, if God is all-knowing, God knows everything that could be chosen, right? So all of the possibility space is open to God to choose, and God has all the power to choose any of those options. Um, and God is omnibenevolent, all good. So God will always choose the best of all possible uh, options that God knows, which is all of them, uh, and is able to give them all power. But then there's evil in the world, that this poor child prays to dear kind God anyways. So how do we make sense of God having chosen that world? Um, well, what's typically uh, done is uh, theologians and philosophers will construct what's called a theodicy, a story that we tell that makes the existence of evil and uh, of this tri perfect God consistent. And one such uh, uh, theodicy from St. Arrhenius, a Roman, I think, um, is a soul-making theodicy. So the soul-making theodicy should be pretty familiar to all of us, that you don't get good without overcoming evil, right? That if we want to say that something's good, then there has to be some kind of harm in the world that we overcome, and it's in overcoming it that we become good. But you wouldn't have goodness if there weren't that badness to overcome. And so God must have maximined in economists' language, um, created the world with the least amount of suffering to produce the most amount of good to overcome. Um, but what sort of soul making would justify that prayer to dear kind God? That's what Ivan asks. If God willed it, God is not worth worshiping, says Ivan. Um, but maybe we don't have to commit God to having willed the child cry out that prayer in the night. Maybe it could be because humans are awful and uh, we just like to cause harm. And there are a special few of us that like to cause harm to children, which is so much worse, like the three um, adults in his stories. So Ivan declares here that the soul-making theodicy is inadequate. Innocent suffering, the evil done to children cannot be atoned for by any amount of created goodness, that innocence is or ought to be um, kept pristine. And yeah, it's not. So there's another theodicy out there. It's the free will theodicy that um, the ultimate good is to have free will. This is St. Augustine now. Um, St. Augustine says, look, God created a world that was maximally free. Uh, and then like that was all God needed to do to pr produce the best of all possible worlds. And if there is any evil in the world, it's not God's fault. It's our fault. Uh, but it can be our fault, not traceable back to God because we are free. So I've been contends with this one too. Um, and this is our um, second argument. So what's left when we accept the existence of evil in the form of innocence lost and of a higher good, the possibility of perfection, the beatific vision? Um, well, as Ivan says, let me tell you novice that the absurd, and here we're highlighting the absurd, that's what's left. The absurd is only too necessary on earth. The world stands on absurdities and perhaps nothing would have come to pass in it without them. We know what we know, and what I know is that I understand nothing. I don't want to understand anything now. 
If I try to understand anything, I shall be false to the fact and I have determined to stick to the fact. So between the promise of perfection, to accept God, right? To say, look, um, there is this idea of heaven out there and we can be saved in it. Um, does not atone for the suffering and loss of innocence on the earth. And we recognize both at once as being possible and accepting God um, and being a part of the world, we are left in, in the middle, in, in, in our own form of suffering, which is the, uh, the absurd condition of being. That um, what we want and what is, what we accept could be, and what has been um, are unreconcilable together. So suffering exists, premise one. Premise two, nobody is to blame for the existence of suffering because cause follows effect, right? So say like we're in a deterministic world, we don't cause free choices, we think we do, but everything's just like a rock rolling down a hill. Um, so we can infer that survival requires that we choose to be complicit in the world's continual production of suffering, right? That the world is just made in a way that people will suffer. It just happens that way. And even if we're not fully deterministic, right? Even if we live in a world with free will, the world is still constituted in a way that even if we don't want to make bad choices, we're forced to, right? We choose our battles and we lose the ones that we don't choose to fight. Um, but this sort of free choice, which leads to suffering inevitably, seems unblameable, or at least Ivan doesn't want to say, look, you're terrible for the, the sins of omission that you um, are responsible for. So in Catholicism, there's sin by commission. Uh, I shoot somebody and sin by omission. Uh, I don't stop the shooter from shooting somebody, right? Um, so Ivan says like, look, the sin by omission thing, like if you're choosing your battles, um, you can't help but to be a part of this world that suffers and causes its own, its own forms of suffering. Um, our free choices are constrained and they're constrained by the necessity of things that we must suffer. So um, it might be that this freedom is an eventual price that we have to pay for the beatific vision, for that harmony at the end of things. It might just turn out that this world that is constituted by, that stands and rests upon the absurd, um, that abides the loss and violation of innocence, that sees humans doing terrible things to one another and mm -hmm doing terrible things to the world. Uh, maybe this is all necessary. Maybe all of this is just, they're, they're just a bunch of building blocks, Legos stacking up, building that perfect staircase to uh, heaven where eventually we can all climb and um, it's all made up for, right? Because it'll all be nice. But Ivan will still reject that kind of harmony because it's not worth it. Freedom is too high a price to pay for goodness, says Ivan. While there is still time, I hasten to protect myself, and so I renounce that higher harmony altogether. It's not worth the tears of that one tortured child who beats itself on the breast with its little fist and prayed in its stinking outhouse with its unexpiated tears to dear kind God. It's not worth it because those tears are unatoned for. But why can't God's higher harmony atone for the tears of suffering, according to Ivan. Why doesn't that beatific vision, the heaven on earth sort of picture, make up for it, according to Ivan? Well, there are possibilities for atonement. One, it could be that there's a hell, right? And that the sinners, the ones who caused suffering, like the good place, all go there, right? Those of us who are guilty are punished. But then what kind of perfect harmony rests upon the back of thousands of burning, suffering souls? What sort of perfection is that? that accepts continued suffering and pain. That doesn't seem like a complete perfect unity of goodness and uh, moral perfection. There's still all sorts of terrible stuff happening, just you know, like brushed under the rug, the rug being the gateway to hell. Um, atonement, uh, so uh, the other possibility for atonement is um, that it's not the, it's not God and this beatific vision, this complete project that 
that makes up for all of the suffering, all of the lost innocence, all of the privation and destruction of humanity, but it's some other force, the force of Christianity, the force of Christ, where Christ is a figure who is invited into the story of um, the Abrahamic religious world to do just this work, that it's through Christ's death, it's through God becoming man and, uh, and being sacrificed through bleeding his own blood for us, that that is what makes the atoning moment, that it's through Christ's death that um, it's all made up for in the end. And some feature of Christ is able to um, do that work. And Ivan is surprised, right, when Alyosha brings it up. He says, I'm surprised you didn't bring up Christ earlier. Usually when I'm talking to Christians, that's the first thing they say, right? They don't deal with all of this heady theodicy nonsense, right? They just skip straight to the punch that Christ makes up for all of it, right? He died for our sins, right? Um, and even so, Ivan says, and then justifies with the Grand Inquisitor passage, that I would rather remain with my unavenged suffering and unsatisfied indignation, even if I were wrong, right? That even if I were wrong, says Ivan, the fact that it happened at all, that that child in her stinking outhouse prayed to dear kind God even once, even though it was made up for in the end through the Christ-like redemption, that it's still not worth it. And I, I says Ivan, I'm willing to be wrong and committed to being wrong, but I don't think I am. Besides, too high a price is asked for harmony. It's beyond our means to pay so much to enter in on it. And so I hasten to give back my entrance ticket. And if I'm an honest man, I'm bound to give it back as soon as possible. It's not God that I don't accept. Alyosha, only I most respectfully return him the ticket. And that's rebellion, murmurs Alyosha. Ivan resolves himself to rebellion in the face of the absurd world, in the face of the fact of suffering and the acceptance of God, before he will resolve himself to the justification of a world in which children suffer, in which innocence is lost. And Ivan, the aspect of the intellect, where the mind presses himself and this terrible thought into the soul, into Alyosha, into the aspect of innocence. And the mind corners the soul and with no room left to back out from asks its terrible question. I challenge you answer. Imagine that you are creating a fabric of human destiny with the object of making men happy in the end, giving peace and rest at last, but that it was essential and inevitable to torture to death only one tiny creature, a baby, for instance. And to found that edifice on its unavenged tears, would you consent to be the architect on those conditions? Tell me the truth. To which Alyosha replies, no, I would not consent. So. Let's break out in groups and ask this question of ourselves. Um, the, more simply put, like, would, would you torture uh, a baby if you could cure cancer kind of thing? It's like that kind of question, right? But sort of more grand and holistic that would you torture to death a single baby if it meant producing uh, perfect harmony in the world for the rest of history? Uh, so I'm going to... Let's see, two, four, six, eight. I think I'll do three groups online. Um, pause the recording and we'll come back. Would you consent to be the architect on those conditions? Tell me the truth. So to be reductive, but it's always interesting to me. Uh, I'm gonna pull the class. Who would consent to torture to death the single baby for the world harmony that follows? It, it's okay. Uh, well, I, think, I, I think I would have to talk to you about it. Oh, okay, so I see a few. How about online? Do you, does anybody consent online to, to torture to death a single baby for the sake of all human happiness for the rest of history? Okay, and who doesn't consent? And there's a bunch of people online who are cheating. Oh, here we go. No, I think that's everybody voting. Okay. Uh, um, who would torture to death one single adult? Okay, more enthusiastic hands, but it looks like about the same. Maybe some wavering. All right. Um, can I make the case different? 
uh, who would torture to, who would whip a horse in the eye to create this world with a stick? Really? I mean, like, like I get it, but like, it's kind of surprising. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, so, 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 so does Dostoevsky, the, the, the horse getting whipped is like a theme in his books that shows up over and over. Um, okay, so it looks like most of us don't consent. Would someone who does consent share why? I will. It's really grudgingly. I, I went into our discussion, like, saying that I wouldn't. I wish I had more arguments as to why I, I wouldn't let the baby be tortured. But I really like the idea that torturing a baby now would prevent future babies from being from suffering. And um, I think that just easily equates in my head. Yeah. Yeah. So one baby now, infinite babies relieved later on. Um, so taking a sort of mental calculus in that way seems to really help justify. This is a certainly like consequentialist kind of thinking. Um, good. Anybody else who consented have? Uh, let's see, Olivia. So I didn't say that I consented, but I think from like a utilitarian perspective, it's kind of interesting to think about, um, kind of thinking about the alternative that if you are preventing suffering, then you are kind of what he said, like if you're preventing future suffering, then objectively it could be seen as like worth it, I guess. Um, but there's also like the utilitarian perspective that if we're going to live in a society where we torture babies to create that kind of society and that that can create future problems. But anyway, those were kind of the ideas that were in my head. <laughs> yeah, so this is certainly not Ivan's calculus, right? Ivan, um, nor, nor Alyosha's, surprising. Right? Well, maybe not surprising, I, I don't know. Like, how do you ask a perfectly innocent child, would you kill your friend to make everybody happy, right? Like, even asking that question is, like, kind of cruel, right? And there's Ivan asking Alyosha, and Alyosha is forced to murmur, no, I would not consent, right? But the, so, so Ivan's calculus is not Will's calculus, not this utilitarian calculus. Um, because even in this, like, infinite amount of utility and pleasure and, and the no suffering, right? At all whatsoever, everybody is happy and um, live wonderful, wonderful lives. We're all unified in the beatific vision. We're not even ourselves, we're just like released into heaven, whatever. Right? Um, that even if that happens, the baby was still tortured and that's not worth it to Ivan, right? So Ivan makes the calculus and then rejects it, right? doesn't accept it, but certainly, um, we might think, you know what? That's worth it, right? Um, anybody else? Yeah. I just want to point, point out that, I mean, Ivan's calculations is not just one baby too. It's like a whole history of babies that have suffered. So his scope is way different than I thought it would have been. And they were like justified in your scope of what they be. Yeah, of course. Um, the thought experiment takes the, the justification to the limit though, right? That of course we are appalled by the suffering of children through all history, right? The loss of innocence that has always occurred. Um, it's never helped itself. And not just like, you know, baby gets eaten by tiger. Ivan mentions this. The tiger just knows how to rip and tear. It doesn't no, nor would it, if it could, nail people to fences, right? It wouldn't take such joy and pleasure in the artfulness of the loss of innocence, the destruction of innocence, right? But humans do. Um, and that is certainly abominable, right? Um, but even if it were just one, forget all the rest, just one, and just once, and that's it. Would it still be worth it? Okay. So it sort of puts more weight even on Alyosha. Makes it harder. Yeah, Ashley. I think this isn't about the baby, it's about the person consenting because babies are gonna suffer either way, but the only difference is that you um are like have the guilt. And so it's really like a selfish thing. Oh. 
That's a cool take. Can you say more about the selfishness and guilt that is, so, so what I'm hearing is that the meaning or the power, the like intuition pump of the thought experiment does not tell us whether or not a calculus in one way or the other is worth it, but how we feel about making the calculus at all with that, like a answering or thinking about the question at all does to us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll let you follow up in just one sec. So what I'm hearing then is that if you consent to the thought experiment, you commit an act of baby killing. If you don't consent, then you uh, omit the act, but then are complicit in the world in which babies suffer anyways, in which innocence is, innocence is destroyed. And there's the absurdity, right? Here we are, like, it, the mind sees all of this. Ivan sees all of this and must ask the question and then imposes the question on Alyosha. On Alyosha. And what, what's, what is there except absurdity? There is no right answer. I love this, yeah. There's only um, guilt or rebellion. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Did you say you were going to kill a baby? Um, no, and it's. Not, I'm also not saying this just because I'm a baby atheist. Wow. <laughs> well, maybe I'm a baby atheist, but um, I feel like you almost make it sound like you should kill a baby if babies are going to suffer anyways. Then it would seem selfish not to kill a baby to stop more babies from suffering. I, it seems like you should be obligated to if you're going to say babies are going to suffer anyways. Yeah. It, it just seems like you don't want to be guilty for torturing the baby. Yeah, it's that. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, so, so you didn't consent, Ashley. I did, I did, and then I didn't consent to killing the adult. I actually feel worse about that, and I think I'm like the only person who feels this way. About the adult? Yeah, because like he's grown, and like I feel like I feel more of an adult to know more, and I don't know. I think it's really weird, and it's an incomplete feeling that I have. But. Sure, yeah, it's an interesting one. Um, if it develops, raise your hand. How about someone who didn't consent? Oh. You did? No, that's okay. Yeah. No, uh, why? I was going to expand it maybe a bit farther. I was thinking like a Machiavellian line, which would be um, people want someone who's willing to take on that guilt. And since people want somebody who is willing to do it, but won't do it themselves, you also have a bit of a social obligation to be the person who does. Ah. So and there you I, go. That's part of the reason I was there. That's where you get the Grand Inquisitor. Who's the Grand Inquisitor but the one who does that? who yeah. takes on the suffering of the masses, like the grains of sand in the sea. Yeah, Ruby, did you want to add in? Uh, no, oh, sorry, I, I had something hand. for a fraction of a second, and it <laughs> sure. completely slipped my mind. It's happened a lot in this classroom. Sure, if it, uh, if it comes back, raise your hand. Um, yeah, Rachel. Well, this proposal of like making it about like my own guilt, like I was really trying to think, because I was like, oh, you know, I don't want to hurt anyone in any instance. But like I'll punch like a Nazi or a transphobe for free. Like I, you know what I mean? Like I, there's are instances where I would do certain things or like I can, I, I don't know. I was listening to something where they're like, everyone thinks they couldn't do a murder, but like at some point we all could, you know, there's a certain line in which we all could, but then it's making me like this child thing go back and back and back where I'm trying to find the distinction between when I would do it and when I wouldn't, you know what I mean? Like this isn't, I know this is like an overdone thought experiment, but like baby Hitler, right? Like then do I torture it? Like probably not still. Yeah, it's not but like, like evil Hitler yet. Right. It's just baby Hitler. But I'm yeah. trying to find my own, this isn't a statement or just like a question. I'm trying to find my own like line of which it stops, right? Or like what, at what point do you become not innocent? Mm -hmm. You know? Would you stop someone else from torturing the baby? Wait, so stop someone from torturing the baby because they're deciding to save the mm -hmm. world. Like if I'm going to go torture the baby, would you stop me? Because you, you want to torture the baby. Oh, yikes, dude. <laughs> I mean, it, I feel bad either way because I'm imposing my own morals on someone else, you know? Like, well, I guess what I'm trying to say is I am not an actor that I think could make that decision. 
which would probably make me default to making no decision because either way I'm imposing myself on yeah. someone else. But then there's also a world in which I would, you know, so. And, and I, I like the back and forth too. So, so I mean, the, what I'm hearing is, is that it's vague and ambiguous how you would even come to make the, not just the decision, but like decide what sort of practical reasoning objects, like how do I come to make the decision at all? What are my calculations? What are the pieces that say like I could or couldn't pros and cons? How do I weight anything? Um, even getting to that point pre-decision is really challenging, right? Situation dependent, person dependent, and yet there's Ivan imposing it on his innocent brother. Is he not destroying the innocence of his brother and asking the question? I'm not sure. It seems kind of dark and hard. Jason, you had your hand up. Um, yeah, I was just gonna say, try and gather it again. Um, I dated someone for three years who had a, when we started dating, she had a two-year-old. So I knew this kid for those three years and I didn't really play a parental role, but sometimes kind of did. And I think that just, I don't think it changed my view on this kind of thing, but it really cemented it. So it's just kind of axiomatic that this suffering of a child is completely unacceptable. So one child that's completely unacceptable, a ton of shit, like it's, they're both just kind of infinitely unacceptable. So in, in neither scenario, like I wouldn't consent to the one child being tortured. And I also think the alternative is just as bad basically. And it's axiomatic, like there's not a, rational line of reasoning I take to get there. That's just how it is. And so it is with Ivan, right? Because it's it's not axiomatic, it's absurd. There's no right answer. It's, it's impossible to make the choice in both um, conditions. And yet the noble spirit of the Karamazov brother, Alyosha and Ivan both reject. They both say no. Um, and that speaks to something. It's not just Ivan is rebelling, Alyosha rebels as well. Alyosha, who is the Christ figure of the story, um, rebels just as well as his brother in recognizing the absurdity of this, in being forced to see the absurdity of his condition. Um, yeah, good. Any final comments, thoughts before we move on? Yeah, actually. I'm just wondering, is anyone answering um, to like in the way that like like just seeing themselves or their answer of like the perfect moral person like is that how you're answering because like for me it's like i'm okay with being perfect like i think that it's justifiable and i'm okay with being you know having whatever guilt and like being not correct in my decision because ultimately I don't care like the, the fact that it has them. Yeah. yeah, that's a good question. So when we're thinking about this question, were we thinking about it, I'll get you in a second, Ruby. Were we thinking about it in terms of like, this is what the perfect person should say, yes or no? Or this is what I would say, yes or no? Did, did anybody make that consideration or was it mostly us or mostly perfect person, Ruby? Uh, yeah, I, for, for me, uh, I think, you know, uh, in our discussions, we discussed it as like, uh, as like us doing it, not because, because like, A, because to say a perfect person is in the situation would be to say there is a correct answer uh, to, to some degree, which is, you know, kind of not part of the point, but also that uh, an intrinsic part of it that needs to be taken into consideration is that this is not something you can easily live with. If you're looking at it from a utilitarian perspective, like you are choosing to cause immense suffering on one innocent actor in order to cause, like create happiness for everyone else, but it's also creating unhappiness for you. Mm -hmm. And self selfishly, if you're looking at it from a selfish perspective, you have a really, really strong understanding of the trauma that is causing. You are standing in front of this baby with the, uh, you know, the, the whip of nine, the cat of nine tails in your hand and going, oh God, that's something you're going to have to live with. And that's, you know, how the, what, what the decision is, is that this is something where no one comes out of it unscathed. And so I think a perfect actor in this situation isn't 
really possible. I don't think it's possible to come out of it without guilt, without to some degree of guilt. Yeah, cool. Um, Lux, do you want to follow up? Um, well, an extension of that would be then if you kill the baby, there's no way that you could have a world without any suffering. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I mean, anyway, you couldn't have a world without any suffering because there has to be some level of suffering to, you know, produce goods. Like you have to have a forest fire in order to regrow a forest, and that forest fire has suffering that you know, yeah, comes with it. Yeah, the poor little possums and fawns and stuff burning up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So exactly, Ruby and Lux. Just so this is what I was thinking mm -hmm. as well. Um, as maybe like a follow-up thought of my own um, is th there might be some sort of like meta thing going on in Alyosha being asked the question and saying no, because Alyosha like represents innocence, right? Christ-like innocence. And so he is supposed to be like the perfect person. Everybody in the world loves Alyosha. People who like hate each other both agree that Alyosha is a pretty dope guy, right? Um, and he's on everybody's good side. He makes everybody feel warm and happy, whatever. He represents the perfect person. And so the, the thought experiment is not just, is one child, forget all the rest, is, is the destruction of their innocence worth the perfect world to follow? Um, but is the guilt that comes from consenting from the loss of that innocence, to be the one who commits the, the terrible crime to, to that innocent child, could someone as perfect as Alyosha, the Christ-like figure themselves, um, fit into that world that they were the architect of? And I think the suggestion from what I'm hearing, Lux and Ruby is like, no, they wouldn't fit in that, Ashley as well. Yeah. Um, and there's just more absurdity, right? There's no right answer. And there's no perfect person who can solve it for us. And, uh, and it all happens right in this chapter, Rebellion, before the Grand Inquisitor. And in the Grand Inquisitor, Ivan makes it real that even Christ is not enough. Even the, the redemptive salvation of this figure of Christianity who does actually make up for it all, right? This is the, the Christian belief, is that in Christ's sacrifice on the cross, he bleeds for our sins and our sins are washed away, right? Um, and so if you're Catholic or Episcopalian, or whatever, you accept the body and blood of Christ into yourself to uh, represent this renewed innocence every week. Um, even that sort of being, even that being who would make Ivan wrong can't make the world right, according to Ivan, given the Grand Inquisitor passage. So we'll talk about that. Let's take like five minutes, have a break, have a breath, you know, like get a drink of water, whatever it takes, and uh, we'll be back at 628. Okay. Um, so Grand Inquisitor passage. Uh, Ivan has rejected the soul-making theodicy that the evil in the world cannot ever be made up for because the sort of evil, which is the destruction of the innocence of children, is irredeemable. Nor is our free will a price worth paying for that beatific vision, right? Because the, the torturing to death of a single child for the sake of it all, to freely choose, um, would, uh, well, we wouldn't consent. And even if we did, we might still be plagued with the guilt that uh, in us lives a personal hell while everybody else goes on and that's no harmony either. Uh, but Alyosha says, what about Christ? Christ might save us, Christ did save us. And Ivan says, ha ha, I wrote a poem last year um, that uh, uh, tells you why that is a silly thought. So the purpose um, there's like two purposes of the Grand Inquisitor passage. The first is that even Jesus, the forgiving, innocent Christ, could not save us because humans, insofar as we are part of the world, this absurd world, are irredeemable ourselves. The world is absurd. Humans are absurd. All is beyond redemption. And even if Jesus could save us, even if Christ gave us a promise, a way to freely choose the beatific vision, the, the love and the harmony of the salvation that comes through unity with God, we would fail. We could not. We would fall into suffering freely again and again and again. 
And there's a second purpose, which is that Ivan, as I suggested earlier, is no nihilist. He proposes an alternative way to cope with this absurdity, with that even if we could freely choose without suffering, without torturing to death a single child, um, to, to get that salvation in heaven, that we would fail, that that's just the absurd world and the absurd condition of being that we're in. Um, there's an alternative way through the muck to rebel against the absurd and find our way uh, to a world that works to one that Ivan and those of us who um, do not consent um, can accept. And his alternative is to make the world a better place through the production of great human beings who take on the suffering of the world themselves. Okay, so the story, it's the 16th century. We're in a small town in Seville or outside Seville um, in uh, the height of the Spanish Inquisition. Uh, and Ivan is channeling the spirit of the monks of the day, uh, the only intellectuals to be spoken of. So he like sort of uses the, the language, that monastic language, thou and thyself and all this. Um, and uh, our story is uh, wearing the dress of these tales uh, like those told by the monks of Jesus's return. What would it be like, right? It's alternative history sort of stories, but for um, the 16th century. So uh, we're in Seville, Spain, uh, the day after a great auto de fe, a great burning of heretics, a hundred of the town's people, already a small town, burned at the stake for heresy. Um, and so there's this like subdued, subtle quality of death in the air. Everyone is sort of in sublimity, right? Where they're in awe at the terrible thing that they witnessed. And um sort of trapped by the spiritual power of it too it's not just disgusting like i just watched 100 people burn at the stake but burn for a reason a spiritual reason and they feel this right um so they're they're subdued spiritually um <laughs> and the next day everything in the town is normal um yet in the quiet repose of the fire's af aftermath jesus returns jesus returns to seville and he performs two miracles in the crowd um, first, he heals a, a blind man's sight, uh, sort of recreating the Saul to Paul um, apostlehood story. Um, and second, reviving a little girl from death, right? flowers in her eyes, Ophelia sort of style, um, the Lazarus risen from the dead, except this time it's a young girl, a small child, sort of thematic for the conversation Ivan and ourselves in class have just been having. Um, the inquisitor, the grand inquisitor, the leader, of the Inquisition who committed the Atada Fe uh, the day before um, is, uh, he witnesses what's happened, these two miracles and orders the guards to collect Jesus, arrest that man. And the crowd parts, right? The crowd knows that this is Christ before them, right? That Jesus has returned um, and like lifted a girl from the veil of death and yet they part for the guards because the human power of the inquisitor surpasses even that spiritual power of the magic of miracle, right? The atoda fe, the burning of a hundred heretics the day before has suppressed them so spiritually, so powerfully that they part for the guards and the guards arrest Jesus and bring Christ up to the grand inquisitor's chambers. So at once we have themes, herd mentality, a slave ethic. These people are weak to the power of the church of the inquisition. Um, and it's sort of a first setting of the motif that follows through with the rest of the Grand Inquisitor passage, which is that the general population uh, will not choose Christ. There, there's Christ before them. They could stop the guards, right? Uh, maybe Jesus will raise them up from the dead if the guards fight back, right? Um, and yet they are subdued. Um, even miracles cannot inspire, inspire uh, like power and death. So the day passes into night before Jesus is brought into the inquisitor's chamber and the inquisitor asks, is it thou? Is it thou? Uh, now on the syllabus, I have I and thou from Martin Buber as like an optional reading. Martin Buber has this really cool like Jewish mysticism, existentialist stuff going on. Um, he's not really read much anymore, but was really popular like 40, 50 years ago. Um, and his book, I and Thou, distinguishes between these two um, words where thou is supposed to like 
represent not just the the um, like like you, um, but it has like a spiritual power that it it captures um, the the magnificence of one's like soul spiritual life or whatever so in asking is it thou it's not just is it you are you jesus right because that's human all too human right but is it thou is speaking not just to the man but to the trinity right is it thou are you all three of them right and then before allowing christ to answer says be silent and jesus remains silent through the rest of the play in the scene you come to hinder us says the Inquisitor. But what's being hindered and who are we? The Inquisitor is about to explain everything. Alyosha at one point asks, what if it's simply a mistaken identity? But this doesn't matter because even if the being that raised the girl from the dead and pulled the scales from the blind man's eyes, um, even if this is a mistaken identity, it's not Jesus, we still get the Grand Inquisitor's credo, right? this whole story. Um, and that's where the meaning and power is. By speaking, finally, after so many decades of exercising power, the Inquisitor is finally to reveal his terrible truth. Tomorrow, I shall condemn thee and burn thee as the worst of the heretics. And why would he do this? Well, it's because Jesus started a project 15 centuries ago. He inspired in the people of freedom so great as to overthrow the Roman Republic, to bring the power of Rome down to its knees and work for the free will of the people. But once this task was achieved, that free will was given over to power and became something very different from what was originally intended. It became the church. And for Ivan and the Grand Inquisitor, something far greater and far more ter terrible follows from this transition of the message of Christ and his followers who wrote nothing down, right? Because they thought the world was going to end. Um, and then it becomes the church, it becomes codified in the church, serves a very different purpose and is realized through the 15 centuries that follows in a terrible purpose, but one that, as Ivan will argue, is necessary to overcome the absurdity of our condition. Jesus promised humans freedom, freedom from the shackles of their physical form, freedom from their sins, freedom from uh, the past and from the future. It gave them salvation in an afterlife, and he gave them freedom. He lifted men from the dead and walked on water and gave people bread and fish, right? And now people are more persuaded than ever that they have perfect freedom, yet they have brought their freedom to us, the church, and laid it humbly at our feet. Because people have laid down their freedom at the feet of the church for the first time ever, it is possible to think of the happiness of humanity. It is only because the people have laid down their freedom at our feet that we can think about happiness. Which is to say that happiness is impossible, according to the Inquisitor, without the sacrifice of freedom. And this is the absurd state of humankind's position in the world. We cannot be happy as long as we are free. We must be either free and powerful or unfettered and happy. And by giving people freedom, the Grand Inquisitor continues, thou didst reject the only way by which people may be made happy. Freedom and happiness are independent projects. Jesus gave people freedom and insofar as he did, made it impossible for them to be happy. But Jesus had an opportunity to resolve the suffering of mankind. In fact, he had three opportunities, says the Grand Inquisitor which is the three temptations that Jesus suffers or is um, pressed upon by Satan in uh, the desert, right? So Jesus spends 40 days and 40 nights in the desert. And at the end of it, uh, Satan tempts him three times. This is just before he, I think it's just, before, it's been a long time, but uh, correct me if I'm wrong. The timeline is he's in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights and then like garden of Gethsemane, And then he's like arrested and sacrificed. So he's like tempted these three times um, and rejects all three temptations. But it turns out these temptations, according to the Grand Inquisitor, through the projects of the church and sacrifice of freedom, are the way to overcome absurdity to provide happiness for humans. And the bread and the fish, the walking on water, the raising Lazarus from the dead, these were no miracles. These were ill-fated promises of freedom that only caused more suffering. The only real miracles were those that Jesus, that Christ, turned down when promised by Satan. And this is like pretty, like heady, dark stuff. And keep in mind, just like in the, the intentional fallacy sort of bit floating out there, Dostoevsky is a Christian. He's an Orthodox. He's nothing like any Orthodoxy, Orthodox Christian that you would read about on Wikipedia or whatever. He was his own weird, freaky version of it, but he was Christian, right? So 
Um, this is coming through Dostoevsky's voice, his character. So keep that in mind in the background. So the Grand Inquisitor calls each of Satan's three temptations the only real miracles to have ever occurred. Um, to him, it makes uh, no difference whether a group of people is fed fish and bread for a day, um, if one man is restored from life, uh, restored to life, if a blind person is able to see. What matters is the greater good. What would it take to accept the world, regardless of accepting God? And because these three temptations were stated, their possibility and vis-a-vis -vis their permissibility became real on earth, right? So in the same sort of way that insofar as we act, we commit ourselves to the possibility, to the permissibility of an action. We'll see this in Sartre later on in the semester, that we are radically free, as he says, that if I do something, I'm telling the whole rest of the world, this is something that can be done by people, right? And just in the same sort of way, likewise, that um, the possibility that it's open to our freedom to cause the destruction of innocence, the suffering of children, um, the naming of these temptations by Satan to Jesus makes the reality of the temptations possible here on earth. And it's been the Grand Inquisitor's job to realize those temptations, to undo the, uh, the, the, the non-consent of Christ in the desert um, and promise happiness to uh, the people. For in those three questions, the whole subsequent history of mankind is, as it were, brought together into one whole and foretold. And in them are united all the unsolved historical contradictions of human nature. The absurdity is resolved in these three temptations. So if the Grand Inquisitor and his learned group of empowered people can reform the world, they can remove its bite, its absurdity. But they do so only with the fuel of the freedom of the masses, which is sacrificed to their project for the sake of those people's happiness. Nothing has ever been more unsupportable in human society than freedom, says the Grand Inquisitor. People are not strong enough to bear it. And so the temptations, the first of which is bread. Satan says, look, I'll feed the world. All you have to do is deny that you're God, right? Just become a man. Tell the world that you're Christ. Show the world what you are. Give the world your power. And I will feed the world, says Satan. And Jesus says, no. Jesus turns down the temptation of bread for all, saying that men need more uh, than to fill their stomachs to be fed spiritual bread. And so I promised them spiritual bread. But the Grand Inquisitor's reply to this is that what is freedom worth if obedience is bought with bread, right? You starve a population and they fall to their knees. They'll do whatever you say if you give them just the food that they need, right? And so much suffering is caused over our stomachs, over our need and not just our stomachs in terms of food, but just in general, the passions and uh, requisites it takes to like keep this going, right? The, the uh, sweatshop clothes and uh, the animal products, the fossil fuels that take us to and from work, all of this is just sort of represented in the bread. But what is freedom worth if it's so easily sacrificed when we're hungry, when we're naked and cold? when we need a roof over our heads. There is no crime and therefore no sin in the sacrifice of freedom and what's done to sate hunger. There's only hunger. We can't blame the people for being hungry. Right? We can't blame the people for what follows in their actions from being hungry. It's not their fault. So the Grand Inquisitor is telling Jesus that prior to any power that the spirit may have in a common person, the first and most powerful need is to fill one's stomach, to stay alive to keep a roof over your head. And so by feeding the need for bread, the institution that the Grand Inquisitor and other powerful people have created could demand of them their own virtue. They can say, fall to your knees, do as I say, I will feed you and all will be well. And in feeding the people, that group, the, the ones who run the world, right? This 100,000 who are strong enough to see the world as absurd, but in seeing the world as absurd to allow those who are not strong enough to sort of live in the wake easily and happily. Um, these people can uh, decide what is good and what is bad. People will not need to decide for themselves just so long as their bellies are full and being fed by those who recognize the absurd and set the rules themselves. Now, Ivan's ultimate project, I think, is gonna be to say that you don't take advantage of these grains of sand in the sea, the people who need the bread in their bellies, you give them good and bad in a way that actually satisfies 
their happiness, that makes their lives okay and worth living, right? You don't give them bread and then make them work in the mines or vote for your political party or whatever. You're doing it for their own sake, for the greater good, right? You're this patriarchal power that oversees and sort of runs the world as a puppet master, but in being the puppet master, you're carrying the puppets in your hands, right? It's heavy, it hurts. Some people can bear an empty stomach for the greatness of spiritual sati satiation, but these people are few, says the Grand Inquisitor. Dost thou care only for the tens of thousands of the great and strong, those who can forego an empty stomach for the sake of spiritual power? While the millions, numerous as the sands of the sea who are weak but love thee, must exist only for the sake of the great and the strong. This is an accusation, right? Is your love only for those who are powerful enough to return it, to honor it, when most can't? Most of us are not strong enough, and it's not our fault. It's not their fault. Only the strong can overcome their worldly needs. But Jesus's love seems only to be for them, says the Grand Inquisitor. But shouldn't it be for everybody? The church provides for everyone. So we give bread, says the Grand Inquisitor, to them all. We are ready to endure the freedom which they, the people, have found so dreadful in order to rule over them. That deception will be our suffering, for she, we shall be forced to lie. And the Grand Inquisitor claims further that people need unification. We need one banner to live under. What we want to do is make sense of the world, to unify it, that we understand the absurdity of our condition. Even in small um, little instances that uh, I, I uh, know that I can't draw a perfect circle, but I can imagine one, right? I can see the difference between mind and world. Um, and even in little instances like that, uh, I try to explain, well, what's the difference? Well, I have these muscles that are only so powerful or whatever. Um, similarly, the human mind in general and sociopolitically tries to unify, to make sense of what we see in our heads as what is good and what ought to be and the world, which is finite and natural and imperfect as it is. Nothing is more seductive for man than his freedom of conscience, but nothing is a greater cause of suffering. Thou didst choose what was utterly beyond the strength of men, acting as though thou didst not love them at all. Instead, taking possession of men's freedom, thou didst increase it and burden the spiritual kingdom of mankind with its sufferings forever. forever. Think of the religious wars that are caused in interpretation of um, uh, what one prophet says over another, right? In these attempts to unify, no, I have the story right. No, I have the story right. We cause suffering for, for everyone. Um, but in the 15th century, since the, the crucifixion, the church has turned Jesus's project on its head and fixed just this problem. Jesus being back now threatens it all once more by offering the people their freedom again. By saying anything more, remember the Grand Inquisitor says, be silent. By saying anything more, by adding anything more to the story of human history, Jesus promises uh, the destruction of the church's project, which has worked to unify, to bring people under the single banner of worship so that they can be fed, so that they can be told what is good and what is bad, so they can be happy, so that they will not suffer. And so the second temptation. Jesus refuses to cast himself down from the rock to prove that he's divine. So Jesus is standing at a cliff and Satan says, hey, jump, and you won't die. Right? You're the son of God. Right? And Jesus says, no, I will not prove materially, empirically, that I am the son of God, because it is a matter of faith, and it's a matter of mystery. And this is what the spiritual power holds true. If Jesus had cast himself down, people would have something to invest their freedom in. There would be no doubting. There would be no, this is the right interpretation. No, this is the right interpretation arguments. There'd be no fights. We saw that. It happened. This is what's right and good. Um, they would not have followed of their own wills. Right? They would not have freely chosen for the sake of faith and for the sake of mystery to follow Christ, but they would have done so out of empirical fact. But thou didst not know that when man rejects miracle, he rejects God too, for man seeks not so much God as the miraculous. By rejecting the second temptation to perform a miracle, Jesus set the precedent, according to the Grand Inquisitor's foregoing statement, to reject God. Right? Show us the miracle and we'll accept God. But in remaining just a man, what miracle is there for us to find proof in the higher power? Right? And so people turn away and they disunify and they believe all sorts of strange things and they disagree more. 
And then finally, the third temptation, the rejection of a single kingdom on earth. So the final temptation, Satan says to Jesus, look, I'll give you all of the powers of, the, of Rome, basically. Um, you'll uh, unify the whole world under a single political banner. You'll be like God emperor forever. And Jesus says, no. But by taking this temptation, Jesus would have solved all of the absurd problems that the world presents for human nature. That we won't fight each other, we'll all live under a single rule of law, there will be no more suffering and murder of children, all of that will be uh, outlawed and uh, the law will be empowered to protect the, the innocence right? that is so dear to us, to everyone. He would have unified the world under this single worship and been able to feed them, give them their unity, give them their, their uh, direction of what's right and what's wrong, sated their need to rebel. Thou art proud of thine elect, but thou hast only the elect while we give the rest to all, right? The elect being the ones who are not like the grains of sand, but those 10,000 who are strong enough. The Grand Inquisitor works for the greater good, while Jesus is accused of only working for the good of the elect, of the strong, the spiritually powerful, the ones who can rise above their human nature. But who cares about human nature when the girl is freezing in the outhouse, sending up her prayer to dear kind God? So the Grand Inquisitor reveals the kingdom of his end on earth. And what happens when he finally gets his way and his work is complete? When the church has made real all of the three temptations, has brought a unified world that feeds people. Well, they're told that they can sin and be forgiven for it. People are fed. They no longer go hungry. They're unified. They don't fight each other. They agree. This is the way. When they do sin, the leaders those 10,000 strong, take that suffering into themselves. They act as vessels for the suffering of those slaves. And says the Grand Inquisitor, all will be happy. All the millions of creatures except the 100,000 who rule over them. For only we, we who guard the mystery, shall be unhappy. And so the Grand Inquisitor concludes. The Grand Inquisitor says that he was tempted too, but he returned from the desert ready to take on his task. But he too, like Jesus, walked out into the desert and accepted the three temptations, fell to them, and is using their spirit to um, complete what he accuses Jesus of having failed to complete, which is to provide for the people. I awakened and I would not serve madness. I turned back and joined the ranks of those who have corrected thy work. I left the proud and went back to the humble for the happiness of the humble, Dixie. And what Dixie means is that all that must be said has been said. It's sort of like QED, right? Uh, logic proof. Um, the mystery has been spoken, revealed, and the argument completed. So what do you take of it? What do you think? Grant, Inquisitor, 100,000 people strong who take on the suffering of the world, Rule them like a shadow cabal, the Illuminati confirmed, right? And all of a sudden, everybody is happy and fed and unified at the, the cost of these 100,000 strong. Yeah, Ruby. Um, this may be just due to my uh, opinions on organized religion as a result of my uh, transgenderism. This felt fascist. Yeah. <laughs> this is extremely <laughs> fascism, right? Yeah. This this man is basically looking Jesus in the eyes and saying, "Well, if you'd been a fascist, we wouldn't have had to." Yeah. And the entire time I'm sitting here going like, "You like th this this reads as a man who has corrupted someone's ideals so much that he he has he has corrupted the doctrine of the church so much." to justify what he's doing, that he is willing to look Jesus in the eyes and go, no, you should have been the fascist. Mm -hmm. we are, we're doing good. You're the one that messed up. And the entire time, like, it, 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 feels, it, it feels agonizing to read. And like, because, because it, it, you know, it, as someone who is very frequently dealt with people who think and feel and act exactly like this, I couldn't help but just shudder with recognition of all the times that like, you know, uh, when, when this is getting into a personal story, but uh, after 
a, a few years ago, my mom got fired from her job and it was a really bad situation for us. We were forced to rely on uh, the, the church, on the Mormon church to give us like food, uh, you know, to give us food from the stores and everything. And it was really great. That was the reason we are, I'm still alive is we were able to eat because of it, because of these people helping us. But also every food, all the food came back with this like acknowledgement where they came back and they were like, so how's your Bible reading? And we're like, oh, uh, you know, we're, we're not like reading the Book of Mormon. We're not reading the Bible. And when I came out as trans, they stopped delivering it. Wow. They stopped caring about us. So to me, this is not him saying we'll take care of the weak. This is him saying fuck everyone else that isn't that doesn't adhere to our values. We're, we'll take care of the weak as long as they believe in us. If they don't believe in us, they can go straight to hell for all I care. We're going to make a world that is collective consciousness, you know, live in ignorance, fucking let the country control your mind. We run this show. I, 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 this made me like skin crawl. I felt it, it felt primal and like uncomfortably yeah. real to the moment in a way that nothing I've read in a really long time has. It, it, it just, it, it hurt. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. Absolutely right. I mean, it, it is really hard to read. So when I promised that I would give an optimistic read of this, I completely agree that it's like super fascist. Um, and that in this world, should Ivan, should Ivan's mission become real, would become something like what you've described where the promise is made and only kept on condition <clears throat> and the condition causes further suffering. Now, from my like ivory tower position, uh, philosophically thinking, I can make consistent the fascist idea as it's presented, terrible as it is, evil as it comes off with good intention. Because you could imagine, right, like the benevolent dictator kind of thing where like you don't have the evil cutting off or whatever, but like humans are weak, we are, the, even the strong are like messed up. Um, and especially those who have organized power um, can cause even more terrible harm. Um, so I, you're absolutely right in how hard and awful it is to read this. And I think Dostoevsky wants us to feel that way. So I wonder, before we move on to other comments, so the, the visceral feeling of reading it, right? Um, even if it was like a negative feeling, was it like good to have the feeling? Oh, that was, it was catharsis, baby. <laughs> yeah. I, just <laughs> yeah. something about like, in, in, a, in a really weird way, it's really easy to forget that the people who hate me believe in something, if that makes sense. Like it, it's 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 easy to forget that they too are human. And I mean I don't mean that in like a we should, you know, like forgive them for their sins in the way of like they also have their justifications. They believe that what they're doing is right. And like to the point where this man can stare Jesus in the face and go, no, you should have followed my ideals. And that like it's, it's cathartic to have it written out and read this like thing that I have felt implicitly in like applied to my own life and see it written out in word of like someone else gets it. And not only do they get it, they, this, this is from what, uh, 1914, 1864, 1864. Wow. I was way off, <laughs> but it, it, it's been like, okay you know, this has been the way that things are for a long time. And it's just, it, it, it's cathartic. It's cathartic as much as it is depressing. Yeah. Okay. So, so two, two things. One, this is like a holistic comment. What I hope in doing these readings, they're really hard and they will remain hard next week, maybe less so, but even then, um, it, it, like we're dealing with like the problem of suicide with like fascism justified. Um, the absurd takes on all sorts of qualities and it hits us. In, different works will hit different of us in different ways. 
Um, and when I said in the first lecture that we're all gonna have like a personal experience with it because the feeling of the absurd is something that we each contend with individually with, with respect to our own lives, right? Um, and that existentialism is something that maybe can't be defined because it is the problem of being is something that is so personal, right? Um, I hope that we have catharsis like this, that we have um, uh, experiences that open us up. So that, like, I really appreciate you sharing with me. That's awesome. And then the, the second part is just to tell you like what happens later on in the book. Ivan has a similar moment where uh, the, the chapter is the devil. It's the other most famous chapter from this book where he manifests the devil and the devil tells him just the same idea, the Grand Inquisitor idea sort of right back to him and it kills him because he sees it now as sick and evil where Ivan here means it as something good and wholesome, but then it's taken up by Satan. Right. And in, in the, the devil saying it back to him, word for word almost, right? Like concept for concept, um, it just drips with poison that crumbles Ivan's spirit and breaks him down. And it becomes like the big narrative moment in the novel, big revelation of the story, which I won't spoil. Um, and he's only saved at the very end from this brain fever that is going on by Alyosha knocking on the door. Right. Alyosha saves him in the end. Um, yeah, so, cool. Um, did you want to follow up one more time, Ruby? Um, no, I, 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 I think you actually got what I had. The only thing I have to add is a, I don't know if it's better in Russian, but this is a really bad poem. <laughs> <laughs> is it? Yeah, it's not much of a poem. Um, great. Okay, so I think Delwin, and then remind me your name. Did you have your hand up? Oh, I actually, yeah, sure. Okay. I didn't, but I will. Okay, yeah, the one too. Well, you have to remember that this is Ivan's poem. And in the beginning, Ivan asks, did God create man or did man create God? Mm -hmm. And that's where we're at here with this whole idea. Is, is religion of God or, or of man? Yeah. And if it's of man... And there is a demon inside all of us, then what must there also be in these organizations? Is the demon in them as well to overcome, to reflect and highlight the absurdity of it all? We're all trying, but this demon is in us. The permissibility, the freedom, the possibility. As Ivan says over and over in the book, everything is permissible. It's in our power to do everything. How terrible is that thought, right? Yeah, cool. Uh, I realized I forgot to answer your question. My name's Shane. Shane. Um, I had my hand up, but I had the same name too. So. Um, Shane, Shane. <laughs> oh, okay. I made that difficult. <laughs> um, I guess I choose the tough topic of like defending it. Um, but, but first, I feel like I have to recognize that like the way it's come to fruition in reality often is not good. So I don't want to be like a kind of like a full supporter of it, but I think it has its merits. I start with uh, Marx's quote that like religion is the op opioid of masses. He meant it quite critically, but I think it'd be taken positively in the sense of like, if you take like maybe a uh, Epicurean view on life that like anxiety is the greatest cause of pain and that this, this free thinking is, is what's really hurting us, uh, then this solution is solving society's greatest problem if you agree that that is the problem. And I think if I can relate to my own life a little bit anecdotally, I can find much of pain in anxiety and decision-making. And so when people come in that know more than me, if I recognize that and help me out, I always feel good about it. And I think this is that extrapolated to like a society view. And so yeah. that's my defense of it. If it's taken in the right spirit, which when Ivan presents it, I, I read it as being in the right spirit. That's why he shares it with Alyosha. He's not trying to hurt Alyosha, I don't think. But then when the devil returns it to him, it is not in the right spirit, but it is the same content, right? And this strikes me as like more just absurdity, right? Is it the same idea that can represent like the true salvation of humankind that promises human happiness and spiritual salvation for those who are strong enough to like be a part of it can also be this destructive force that um ruins us all right uh and it's just like who's the one sharing the idea yeah cool other shame 
alternative shame, shame, <laughs> shame as well. Or the other shame. Um, I was going to say that I read this book like two years ago, and it was after reading the book called The New Life Archipelago, and it was referenced multiple times because it kind of prophesized what would happen to Russia or the Soviet Union. The Gulag Archipelago did. By Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Yeah, like, sure. Yeah. Um, and Master and Margarita? What's that? Is that Master and Margarita? The author of Master and Margarita? Oh, I don't know. He wrote uh, Cancer War Disease. <laughs> But anyway, he was a, he was in prison in, in the Soviet gulags in like the fifties, and it kind of cued me into this. And actually, I read *Man's Search for Meaning*, and I was like, "That's the wrong book." And then I went and, uh, and read back to this, and I was like, "Oh wow!" So when I read *The Grand Inquisitor* the first time, I was like, "Oh, this is all about fascism, socialism, totalitarianism." You know, it was just this big prediction and warning. Yeah, so that's, that was. I was just going to point it to a broader scope than just fascism. It's like everything in the 20th century that was awful, basically. Yeah. Um, Dostoevsky, Tolstoy as well, um, similar period, all have um, warnings of their own, which are, they, they come off as politically interesting if you take the political side of things. The way that I read it is that I think Tolstoy and Dostoevsky, shh, I, I don't, I haven't read nearly as much Tolstoy, but um, when I know that they, they seem to share like similar political warnings that they, they say like, look, the communists are nihilists and that's scary. And the, the czarists and um, the aristocrats uh, perpetuate like suffering and, and fascism, totalitarianism, and that's no good. And all we can do is be like uh, as good as we can, I suppose. I find our own strange ways of your Dostoevsky of sinning your way to Jesus or if you're Tolstoy of being a Levinite, an agrarian philosopher of some sort, but but, but yeah, that that um, this is meant to be both uh, in a in a political light, uh, a promise and a warning, right? Um, and again, it's like the mouthpiece, right? Humans will turn things pretty terrible, and um, yeah. Oh, sure. You don't forget that guy burned a hundred people that day, regardless of how good his idea was. Sure. It was predicated on burning a bunch of people first to get them out of the way. And yes. Just clear the once, once you do that, you'll you have to justify a few things. Right. <laughs> yeah. 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 Maybe like a hundred things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, what else? Thoughts about Grand Inquisitor? Yeah, Rachel. Well, this is what y'all are talking about is making me just. I mean, my thesis is things are ambiguous. Turns out, but like. I was talking with my friend the other day because we're all like, you know, kind of going into like doomer territory. We're like, oh, the world's actually cursed. Like we are going to probably see the effects of climate. We already are, but like, you know, at least our next generation is likely to see like catastrophic effects. And we're like, what, you know, what, I think that a lot of people are in denial about how bad it is in a lot of ways because it's hard to face. But then at the same time, you're trying to come up with like, you know, <laughs> like ways that would change it in, an, in a magnitudinal enough way that would solve in the correct time frame. And we were like, would it be worth it to have like a green dictatorship? Like if it ensured the continuity of society and that we switched over to these things, but like, that's so antithetical. Like, I don't know, I was seeing like the, uh, it's kind of like a dictatorship of the current socio-political economic structure of the world and the tragedy of the commons that has led to this problem. But at the same time, it seems like the only way to get us out of this problem is that almost dictatorial, like fast action, like democracy, like the tragedy of democracy is it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of like agreement is very like rarely reached. I think Foucault had something on it. I forget what it was, but like, I don't know. I was just like, it was puzzling me because I'm like, eh, these two things are antithetical, but then also maybe like that's the only way that we could solve. And is it worth it? I don't know. Yeah. It's the like, religion um, that uh, takes over in The Handmaid's Tale. That takes over, sorry? In, in The Handmaid's Tale. Oh, the yeah. Gilead. Yeah. yeah, right. Because like no children can be born. And so you create a, a theocratic autocracy that um, subjugates women to terrible conditions. Yeah, but it they about make about babies, it. right? The human race can continue. Yeah. 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 And but the environment is another one of those things. It's not talked about very much, but it's like 
that was like also like one of the big things that they decided to like control the population for. So that they have yeah, time. justifications for the greater good mm -hmm. are very scary. And yet we think like, well, you can at least imagine a case in which there's someone who's capable of doing the benevolent dictator thing perfectly, right? So um, if anybody's read Plato's Republic, the Republic runs in parallel with the Grand Inquisitor passage, like concept for concept, right? There's like a noble lie and philosopher kings and all this, right? Um, and so like for Plato, he suggests, look, the perfect society is one that's ruled by a philosopher monarch who like exits the cave and sees the world of forms, the world as it really is, comes back and then rules society perfectly because they know the truth with the capital T of everything. So they can just like lead you forward. Um, but nobody is a philosopher monarch. Nobody is a perfect ruler that can do the benevolent dictatorship thing. Um, there will be screw ups. And so, yeah, I mean, like the, this, this idea of giving all power to a person or a group that can do great good with it also comes with the fact that they're people and that they have a demon inside of them and might cause suffering themselves. Um, and this, again, just like the back and forth of the Grand Inquisitor passage said by Ivan, said by the devil. Good. Anybody else before we wrap up online? Yeah, Rachel. I have one more question. Yeah. Uh, can you, when you were saying the, the temptations for Christ were like the, I'm going to screw this up, but like symbolic almost of freedom. Is that what it was? Yeah. So I just didn't really understand. Yeah, the, the devil, Satan, offers Jesus bread for all. Um, just, you know, like reveal your Christhood. Um, and Jesus says no, that people, in spite of themselves, their stomachs, must choose to have faith, right? That it's in exercising freedom that their faith and their Christhood, like the internal... Um, godhead in all of us if there is some part of a godhead in all of us that's how that's realized um prove yourself through miracles says satan and i will end the world's suffering jesus says no because to prove myself through miracle is to force the choice who could say no to someone who um you know like was flying around Right. It's, you're floating above the air and there's you know, it's no magician's trick, right? Who could say that um, they don't believe in that person and their message? Uh, likewise, uh, I'll give you the power of Rome, the whole, um, all of the authority that one could ever have eternally. And Christ again says no, because this forces people into unity when they should choose it for themselves. Because to freely choose the the vision and um and image of god not of not just of like humankind but of like the world and of society wouldn't that be such a better so much better a world so much more perfect than the one that we're just forced to be a part of and the grand inquisitor says no right much better to force us to be a part of it so that we can get rid of suffering and make the world acceptable and stop children suffering um great idea but then what happens when it's put in human hands? Did that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. So um, how does the passage end? I'm on like the last two pages here and then we'll cut out. So I'm sorry, this went a little bit long. How does the passage end? J Jesus never replies. The Grand Inquisitor said, be silent. And so Jesus is. The Grand Inquisitor is out of energy and breath and he asked Jesus to speak, but Jesus has nothing more to add. Jesus simply kisses the Grand Inquisitor on the lips. The Grand Inquisitor tells Jesus to go, be free, but do not come back. In this moment of new weakness, new revelation, it's a surprise. Why does he let him go? Here's my interpretation. This is the optimistic interpretation, right? It's that Jesus has been commanded to remain silent for any more words would indeed cause the world to fall as the Grand Inquisitor foretold. More freedom, more destruction, more unhappiness, more suffering, more destruction of innocence. Jesus hears and agrees with the Grand Inquisitor's argument. For to speak would be to give freedom to the people, which would cause their destruction, for the people are not strong enough. Jesus recognizes this to handle that freedom. 
And Jesus is a force of love and of compassion. Because he's a force of love and compassion, he cannot speak, recognizing that to speak to add more is to cause suffering. And without words, Jesus condones the acts and the goals of the Grand Inquisitor by kissing him on the lips. He loves with all the compassion of a Christ figure, the man who has mistaken himself for an agent of the devil, maybe even for Satan himself, who accepts the three temptations, who makes the church this fascist power out to be um, the only good. Christ condones by kissing. Jesus says in his kiss that the Grand Inquisitor is free to make his world a reality. The Grand Inquisitor himself has that freedom. And so, quote, the kiss glows in his heart, but the old man adheres to his idea. The end. And what do we make of this kiss? What do we make of this freedom? Well, if Jesus kisses him, then maybe we can have hope that the Grand Inquisitor really does turn the church into a force of good that allows those capable of spiritual ascendancy to do so, and those who are not to live happy lives. Um, and maybe not. Maybe the very same idea might turn us into um, a terrible world in which people are subjugated to a single will, the will of 100,000 rulers, Illuminati confirmed, and they're not a very nice Illuminati, right? And Ivan concludes with the fatal Karamazov phrase, everything is permissible. And Alyosha asks, how will you live? How will you love them with such a hell in your heart and your head? How can you? He's shocked. Right? as we all should be after reading this, right? We should be shocked at how terrible the Grand Inquisitor is, and so is Alyosha. How can you live with this in your heart? How can you love at all? How can you, how can you be if this is what you think? And Ivan's reply is that there is strength to endure everything. That's the strength of the Karamazovs. It is the Karamazov way, everything is permissible. Alyosha is shaken to silence by Ivan's reply, the soul no longer has anything to add to this conclusion of the mind. And so Ivan says, I thought that going away from here, I have you at least, but now I see that there is no place for even me in your heart, my dear hermit. The formula, all is lawful, I won't renounce. Will you renounce that for me? Will you renounce me for that? Yes. And Alyosha, without a word, stands, walks to Ivan and kisses him on the lips. That's plagiarism. Um, so next week, we will um, descend further into Christian existentialism, right? So we're reading Kierkegaard, the first half of uh, Fear and Trembling, which is posted on Canvas. So uh, again, this unit is on sort of the problem of being with respect to God, which is where existentialism comes from. Um, and Kierkegaard deals with uh, the absurd as a believer, as a Christian himself. Um, and it, not as a strange senior way to Jesus kind of Christian like Dostoevsky was, but a proper one that um, uh, still took being to be a problem in light of God through the story of the binding of Isaac and Abraham and you know, the eventual salvation stuff. So that's for next week. Um, we'll talk about nights of faith and taking leaps of faith and all that. Um, and for those of you doing the reading group, stick around because we'll get started in I don't know, like five minutes, I got to like reset my brain to do the amount of stuff. So I'll see you next week. Thank you.